Uh, but for today, I'm very um, uh, pleased to introduce Mike Sellers. I've known Mike for a number of years. I don't know, yeah, the a mist while. Of time, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the mists of time. Mike is a, uh, a long-time game industry veteran. Uh, was a design lead on such seminal titles as Meridian 59, the first 3D MMO, uh, Ultima Online, um, one of the first MMOs, uh, period, uh, <laughs> and uh, Sims 2. Um, he's currently uh, general manager at uh, Kabam uh, in San Francisco, uh, and he's also, over the years, um, ran several research companies that were doing uh, really interesting work in uh, game AI and social simulation, which is very close to the heart of things that we're also interested in, in here at Santa Cruz. Um, so without further ado, uh, please welcome Mike Sellers. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, that's a, actually a nice, really nice segue. I really had a hard time uh, figuring out what I wanted to talk about here today because for a lot of my careers, you'll see I've had a hard time figure, figuring out what I wanted to talk about. Um, so part of what I wanted to do was to bring you guys news to the front lines. I mean, uh, the, the things we do every day uh, where I am now um, is we're just, we're on the very cutting edge of, of what's happening day by day, sometimes minute by minute, uh, the way things are changing in commercial games. But I also, I didn't want to just do that. I also wanted to talk about AI. So we're going to talk about, about both of those things today. Um, I wanted to use this image too, not for its, its warlike nature, because this is how we feel when we're developing games. It's all very serious and, and there's a lot at stake. And you know, really, this is, uh, let's see, I can do this. What is it? There we go. This is what it really looks like. So, you know, but that's not nearly so inspiring. Um, oh, it's a nice picture. This is, these are some folks at Kabam, um, hard at work at lunch. Um, but anyway, so this is. So I want to I talk about the front lines of game development. Um, I also, like I said, I want to talk about AI. This is actually the title of a talk I, I gave several years ago at DARPA. Um, although this is actually the, the fake title. Um, really, what I was talking about, what I'm talking about a little bit today, <laughs> is AI with feeling, uh, social and emotional AI. So the two things that have been sort of notes in, in my career is that these two are really far apart. Um, and so ultimately what I want to talk about is notes from both sides of this chasm and maybe for lucky, how we can bridge that chasm, uh, which is something I've been trying to do for 20 years. So whoops, let me go back. Real quickly, my history, um, Michael, I talked a little bit about this. I, uh, I'm currently running a game called Rumble the Mad God. I don't know if any of you know it. I hope not because it's terrible for your grades. Um, stay away. Uh, it's an interesting little game that Kabam acquired, and we've been doing using it sort of as an experimental uh, workhorse, uh, trying out some new concepts in uh, social uh, and web games. I'm also working on a couple of mobile games uh, that I can't really talk about. And then, as Michael said, um, I spent uh, about 10 years uh, running a company called Online Alchemy, where we worked, we focused on social AI. I did several contracts with DARPA, uh, also some MMO work. And then going back and back and back into uh, earlier history, I started off in software engineering. I was actually on the first team to use C++ industrially um, way back in the day. Uh, and then got into user interface design when no one really knew what that was. Um, and if anyone knows what a bacon number is, I have a bacon number of two from uh, being in the apocalypse now. So, um, so that's sort of a, a wide range of things. This is the other title I was thinking about for the talk. Uh, because this is how it feels. This is always how it feels when you're when you're doing commercial game development, and frankly, this is how a lot of my career has felt. Um, and the great thing about this snapshot, by the way, this is not photoshopped, uh, is that uh, you never know in a snapshot is this guy having the most epic ride of all time, or is he about to go to the hospital? Um, and it turns out, in this case, moments after the shot was taken, uh, he wiped out so badly that this is in the Tasmanian Surfing Festival that he won the award for the best wipeout of the year. Uh, but you never know. And it's like this all the time. I'm working on several things right now. Are they awesome? Or are they, you know, a, a few seconds away from this? Well, we'll find out. But that's kind of been my, my whole career. Um, my wife once described it as, I told her about a new thing I was going to do, and she went, okay, ch -ch 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 -ch. And I said, what is that, an alarm clock? She said, no, that's the sound the roller coaster makes when it's just going up that hill right before it goes over the top. So that's, uh, that's kind of how things go. This is one other thing I wanted to bring up. Uh, this is a, one of my favorite quotes. 
Um, and it's also how it feels to be in game development, in AI development. If there's anything you're going to be doing that is really extending where things go, you are going to be walking on a lot of unpaved roads. And you're going to feel it. You may not feel it now, but wait a few years and, and you'll definitely feel it. Um, this is something that uh, comes up a lot. And I, just, I wanted to, to bring this up and we'll come back to this later on here too. Okay, so currently, uh, as I said, I work at uh, Kabam. We're uh, one of the, the top companies, uh, top game companies in, in the world now, uh, and yet still not very well known in a lot of circles. Uh, very fast growing. Uh, we have pivoted successfully. Everyone knows what a pivot is. Anyone not know what a pivot is? Okay. It's, it's, okay, pivot. No, no, this, this is good. This is good. Um, pivot in basketball, you, you're going one direction, you have to pivot into the other direction. In business, you're going one direction, you think this is the best thing ever. And you go, wait, no, it's not. It's that we're on that wave and we're about to die. Um, so you have to pivot and take a hard right turn, and then a hard left turn. So Kabam was doing uh, great work in social games on Facebook. Facebook said, hey, guess what? We're going to take 30% of your revenue. And we went, oh, uh, really? Um, and so we said, okay, we're going to be off Facebook. And in less than six months, we went, uh, we, we got, I think, more than 50% of our, of our business off of Facebook. Uh, then we realized, wow, things in, in tablet and mobile are really coming up. They've been big in Asia for a long time. But in Europe and the States, uh, they were really coming up fast, so we moved to that. We now have, uh, last year, 2012, we had the number one top grossing uh, app on the iPad. Um, we are still focused on port and mid-core games. These are two screenshots, by the way. I should say these are gameplay shots. These are not cutscenes or something like that. From uh, our new uh, iOS game uh, for the Fast and Furious 6, uh, in theaters now, as they say. Um, but what this shows you, this is not on an Xbox, this is not on a PlayStation. This is on a tablet. Uh, so this is where games are going. In fact, where games are right now. And we've gone from making silly farms on the web a couple years ago to having games like this on the web and on tablet today. Um, things are changing very, very fast. Just to give you an idea about how games overall are growing, uh, in 2012, 60% of basically everyone um, were qualifiable as gamers in terms of the amount of time they spent playing games. And this includes a lot of people who say, oh, no, I don't, I don't play games. I don't play games. Well, I do play Farmville. And yeah, there's a couple of Kabam games I like, and there's a couple of other games I like, and yeah, you know, I'll play Candy Crush. Sure. So maybe I'll spend 10 hours a week on that, but really I'm not a gamer. What they mean is they're not playing Call of Duty, which is not the same thing at all. Uh, the time spent playing games has uh, doubled uh, in, just in the last several years, and that ramp continues to go up. The growth, though, is, is not evenly distributed, uh, and one of the reasons why there's so much of this uh, chaos is that consoles and PCs are flat, um, and tablet and phones are growing rapidly, in both in terms of the amount of time spent and the amount of money spent. Now, this is all I realize very businessy, very boring stuff. But if you're thinking, I've got a game I want to make, you've got to think about where can I make that game? Where's the best place for me to make that game? You can make the game anywhere you want. But if you want people to see it, you need to think about where it's going to be. And in particular, if you ever want to make money on it, you need to think about all of these things. So this is the situation right now. This is what we call constant whitewater. Everything is changing. Everything has been changing since, well, when I got into games in the late 90s, mid 90s, we were uh, on the front edge of MMOs. Uh, people two or three years ago at GDC, a lot of my friends and colleagues, had been deeply invested in MMOs and said, wait a minute, social games? We have to do that now? What's that about? How do we do that? Free to play? How do we do that? Then two years ago, it was like, okay, we got social games. Wait a minute, we got to do, do tablets and, and phone? How do we do that? Hold on a minute. Last year, it was like, wait, this is real? This is not some experimental thing? The tablets and phones are, are now taking over everything? So this is, this is changing very, very rapidly and is going to continue to. You'll notice off in the distance, there's some, some semi-mythical sort of uh, peaceful water. That always seems like it's out there someplace. I've never seen it. Uh, this is a picture I love. It's not exactly a fair picture, I'll grant you, but it, it's a picture of disruption, of how fast things are changing. 2005, these are both taken in St. Peter's Square, 2005 and 2013. Um, the, uh, the first one was uh, after John Paul II died, and the second one was when Pope Francis was being put in. Now, admittedly, the first one is a picture of a funeral, and you know, a crowd outside a funeral, and the second one is, is a crowd outside an election. But the dramatic change, we are not, you can see there's like two people in the bottom here who have phones up. There is no one... And one playing the DS. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe it's a phone. Texting. Uh, but there's, uh, you can go around the world and find this. This is a, a well-known thing now. If you go to 
uh, Brazil or India or China, I mean, you know, out in Western China, in Mongolia, this is a very common thing. This is worldwide. And this sets up what's known as the red queen problem. I don't know if you've, if you've heard about this. Those of you who have some biology background, you might. Um, it's the idea that in a, in a heavily Darwinian environment, you have to spend a lot of energy to just stay in place, much less get ahead. And this is what games face, because games are in this incredibly Darwinian environment, where basically no one has to play a game. So we're all vying for your attention and everyone's attention. And the game I make is competing against the, the game you make and the game that everybody else makes. So everyone has to um, try and spend a, a lot of energy just to keep up. And this is like with my friends who were kind of goggle-eyed at GDC. Wait, now it's tablets? I don't think about tablets. I just got used to MMOs. And before that, I was in console retail. How can I keep up with this change? It's, it's a problem we all face. This is one of my favorite words uh, that is now essentially obsolete. Disintermediation means that as of a couple years ago, people were going, awesome, we no longer need EA, or Kabam, for that matter. We no longer need publishers. You can, you can create your game, and I'm sure you've all had conversations about this, and many of you have. You can create your game and put it up online, and everyone will find it and buy it, and it's wonderful. And that was true about two years ago, and that time is over. Um, I'm really sad to say that, and I don't mean to take, some, take any glee in this at all, because I was in the same position. Uh, in 2011, uh, the last Hail Mary pass from my last company, we put out a little game that got swallowed up uh, in the end of disintermediation. Um, so the question people say, well, oh, wait a minute, isn't everyone equal online? This is like going back to the start of the web. You know, Coca-Cola is no bigger a brand than I am. Well, that's true, everyone's equal, but everyone's roughly about three inches tall. So it's really, really difficult to find anyone unless you spend a ton of money, as say Coca-Cola has, to, um, to make their brand larger. This is the other people think people talk about. They say, there's infinite shelf space, there's room for everyone. Well, that's true, there is room for everyone. Does that, anyone know what this is? Indiana Jones. Thank you. You gotta wonder the cultural references. I got a couple in here, I'm not sure if they're gonna work or not, so, you know. But this is what I think of when I think of infinite shelf space. My game is out there someplace up, think up in the upper left-hand corner. You'll never find it. And this is the problem. If you are a small developer, um, the age of disintermediation is effectively over because you can no longer get people to find your game. This is a, I wanted to try and put it, uh, this, I want to try to put this chart together because it, it is an answer to a question I get a lot. Well, hang on a minute. Can I still make money if I'm just doing this as a hobbyist or if I'm just doing this as an indie? And yeah, you can. The, the, so the green is what you could make and the brown is what you could lose. Um, if you're doing this on an industrial scale, you're definitely risking the most, but you have by far the most to gain. Um, if you're doing this as a hobbyist, my experience is you can lose a lot of money and occasionally make a little bit. Uh, there is this really interesting little optimum point in what I'm called Lifestyle Plus. I've got a number of, of friends and colleagues who do this, where they have a small company, they're not looking for the next big smash hit, but they run it as a business, and they make enough money. They make enough money to keep a few people going, but there's always this risk that if they're, they're one bad game or one bad release away from having everything go south on them. The only way to have any assurance or any um, stability, ha ha ha, stability, uh, is to go at this at industrial scales. And if you're going to go at this at industrial scales, you have to think about these folks. These are the new kingmakers. These are the ones who can get your, your game known and, and, and thus sold. Um, if, you're on, if you're featured on the Apple App Store or in, in the, the Google uh, App Store, um, it can make the difference, it can make an order of magnitude or multiple orders of magnitude difference and how many people find your game, how many people buy your game, how many people, how many people play your game and talk about your game. Uh, Fast and Furious was uh, featured in, I want to say, and I hope this isn't confidential, uh, close to 100 countries uh, across the world on the App Store. And that has been a huge leap for us, a huge uh, springboard for us. Without that, we would have had a very hard time. This is why I said disintermediation dis intermediation is essentially dead, because these folks, while they aren't game publishers themselves, they are the kingmakers. They are the ones who are vetting your product and saying, you know, you're not really using the features we want to see in this latest generation of tablet or phone. So thanks, but you can put it in the app store, sure, but we're not going to say anything about it. You're going to be back in the back corner of the, the big warehouse. Or this is awesome. You've done fantastic things. You're doing exactly what we want to see. This is great. We're going to put you front and center. And now hundreds of millions of people are going to see you every single day for the next couple of weeks until they find the next flavor of the month. 
So this is the state of things. We've got more games on more platforms. On more platforms, I've talked about sort of tablet and mobile is one thing. It's actually several hundred different things that all operate just a little bit differently. differently. Um, and by the way, PC, console, web, tablet, and phone all have different usage profiles. There's a new thing they talk, everyone talks about with uh, uh, tablet and phone, the couch and pillow set. Most people spend most of their time on their tablets, either on the couch or in the bedroom. Shopping, reading, mostly playing games. Um, for a long time, we were capped in terms of, of what, how much graphics you could, you could push down to, uh, uh, to a tablet or to a phone. Um, for a long time, the, the downloads, max download size was about 25 megabytes. Now the max initial download size seems to be about 50 megabytes, and this is not altogether clear. This is company policy on, like, on Apple's part that changes. Uh, but there are multiple games that, they, that you can find that say, hey, in fact, there's a new Zynga game. You can say, hey, uh, it's, we're going to do a 50 megabyte download, and that's great. But after that, we're going to do a 600 megabyte download. So stay on Wi-Fi. Really, this is, this is what it says. Um, discovery is, our, is a new obstacle. I mean, yes, first you have to create a good game. But uh, after you've created a good game, you get the best game in the world. But if no one can find it, it really doesn't matter in a, in a commercial sense. The result of these things is that our budgets are skyrocketing. Uh, a year or two ago, you could have made a pretty good game that would do pretty well for, if you're doing it commercially, call it five to $800,000. If you're doing it on a shoestring with a bunch of your buddies and eat a lot of top ramen, you know, maybe $100,000. Now you can multiply that by easily a factor of 10, minimum. And again, I've been in the indie space a lot. I, I've, I've talked to a lot of, of groups like yours and I wish this wasn't the case, but this is the news from the front lines. This is where we are right now. One of the, um, the issues that happens when you start multiplying your budgets into multiple millions of dollars is each one becomes a huge bet, like a roulette wheel bet. You're, you're trying to get the best people and the best team, the best design, but you're making a big bet and you don't want that to fail. So failures become really, really costly. Failure is one of those things that we all know is out there but we all think we can avoid it, and we, we do a remarkably poor job of understanding how severe it can be if it happens to us. Um, I haven't done this, but in a metaphorical way in the game industry, we do this far too often. And you might say, okay, failure. Failure's not so bad. How, how bad can a kind of failure be? You guys are all familiar with the recent SimCity launch? Yeah. yeah. Uh, SimCity is one of the most venerable franchises in the game industry. Uh, it's been around since before I was in games. Um, and there were really good people. I've worked with these people. Uh, and, and they were really, really good people uh, on this team. They just, for various reasons, had a big failure. Uh, I mean, like a big crater in the ground kind of failure. Uh, the fi this, this is a, a title, I think, from TechCrunch. Um, the title of an article uh, talking about, uh, about how bad that was. So, I want to talk about game development for a couple minutes using an analogy that's going to take us into sort of again back to, to where we are today. This fellow is a very skilled craftsman. Anyone know what he's doing? Car yeah, carving wood. Okay, good. Yes, yes. He's not a reenactor like that. He's really a, a skilled craftsman. He's making a spoon or a bowl. It kind of depends on, on, on which way the, the wood takes him. He's using an adze. This, this is essentially a Neolithic tool that hasn't changed a whole lot. You can get better ones. Um, so he's using an adze to, uh, to carve out this bowl shape, and you'll notice, you'll notice here how precisely the, the edges of the bowl are drawn, and how carefully the bowl is being shaped. Now, what's, what's really happening here is you've, you've got a craftsman who's doing this, and he's doing it by his eye and his hand and his feel for the wood and his experience and all that. But there is nothing that says you've got to make a 4.5 inch bowl. And, and I should say, usually, they come up with something really, really pretty, eh, but not always. You know, sometimes the wood cracks up, sometimes the, you, know, you hit one strike too many and, and things go wrong to how uh, we do game design and game development today. It's all very individualistic. It's, um, it, it uses tools we've been using for the past 30 years or more. It, it relies on people with a, a you know, skilled eye and good intuition. It's not, though, easily repeatable. It's really inexact. It doesn't give you predictable results. And it's highly prone to, fail to failure. And in a society and a market like ours, if you tell this guy, wow, that's awesome, give me 100 more of those tomorrow. Absent some advanced uh, molding techniques, he's going to sit down and cry because this is what he does. He does this beautiful, beautiful work. And this is where game development and particularly game design has been. 
and we're not leaving behind the craftsmanship, we're not leaving behind the, the skill that goes into this, but things are changing in terms of how we do this. Our tools, as I said, unfortunately, are kind of out of the past century in internet time. I'm not sure if internet years are dog years or not, but things definitely move a lot faster. Um, and these, the tools that we have and the process that we have um, really just kind of come from a prior age, and they don't lend themselves to the precision that we need today. It's kind of like having a sundial where um, it's a lot of craftsmanship here, it's, it's, it's really beautiful, but you really don't know if it works, and you really can't tell exactly what time it is. And this is, the analogy here to games is that you can spend a year or two or three years on a game and just hope that it's good. And this is how things have been done up until just recently, and this is why we have games like the most recent SimCity that came out. And I'll tell you another story about SimCity 3000 from years and years ago. Uh, that game was fully developed and really wasn't fun until just a few weeks before it was released. And they didn't know what was going to happen when they released it. And this is true of most games. They're most stuck in the situation, I hope this thing tells time correctly, I hope the game works correctly. The, the problem is that we um, no longer have the luxury, we really never did have the luxury, of, having, of, of spending two years on something and finding our failures later. We need to find our failures faster, in a less expensive, more correctable way. And this is true, especially now, because almost everything is online. And so you have to find these failures before you release them and after you release them. Um, one second. Um, we just killed a game that I can't talk about. Really interesting game. Um, but we killed it because we realized it was not going to be live up to our standards, because we had better measuring instruments than this. Um, but, uh, and, and that's a very important thing, because killing a game when you're three months into it is less expensive both commercially and emotionally than it is when you're 12 months or 15 months into it. Did, did you have a question? No, uh, not yet. Not yet, okay, good, good. Um, so there's uh, a number of different ways people do this. Um, this is, a, again, one of the things we do uh, where we, we talk about having a stage gate. This is actually a, a diagram by um, Daniel Cook at Spry Fox, who's a, a, got a great uh, blog online about, about game development. We have multiple kill gates. We say, wow, we've got a lot of great ideas. Okay, some of them aren't very good. And then we develop them more and more and more. And each time we, we filter these. The thing is, though, to filter them, we need to have better tools than we've had in the past. We, have, we need to be able to measure, is this game really any good? And to give you an idea of sort of what's on the far end of the spectrum, do you know what this is? Neutrino detector. Wow, see, this is, I love this, yeah. It's a neutrino detector in Japan. <laughs> um, detector? What's that? The what detector? Neutrino detector. Uh, it's, it's about 11,000 photo, photoreceptive cells in, I don't remember how many gallons of water, of purified water. I, I, what I wonder about is how do they purify the lifeboat that they're in? Um, but uh, what it does is it, is it detects uh, the light emitted when a cosmic ray or a neutrino, I should say, um, hits a molecule of water. Um, so this, this is precise measurement. And this isn't what we have in games. It's not what we're going to have. But we're getting close. Um, before launch, uh, we need to understand if a game's, game concept is any good at each of those stage gates I showed you a moment ago. Um, using measurement and using, um, there's different measurements for different stages and that's more detail than we really have time for today. But once we're live in particular, people are moving towards logging, analyzing, understanding essentially every event that happens in the game. Every neutrino that passes through your game, every key press, every user action. And understanding what does that mean about the game. And that sounds very bloodless, very soulless, I'll grant you. And it's kind of true. Um, game design for a lot of time and, and, and game development has been uh, the craftsman's paradise. I've got this great idea, I want to try this thing out. Uh, and we need to keep that. But we are moving past the days of adzes and roughly drawn circles on wood. And we're now talking about things like conjoint analysis and terabytes of, of user data, and understanding from people's behavior what it is they want. And then, and then, saying, okay, here's what they're doing. Can I give them something they want that they don't know they want? And that's really the magic of game design. The, there is a fight, I will tell you, going on between uh, what sometimes is termed uh, data-driven design versus data-informed design. Uh, data-informed is what I just said. We've got this data, what does that mean? How can we design an experience that they aren't expecting that they're going to love? As opposed to data-driven, which says, here's what they did, here, here's, here's what the players did, here's what somebody else did in a similar game, 
we're going to do exactly the same thing. And that's a very, very easy hole, especially a very low risk hole for people to, to fall into. Uh, what we're finding, of course, is that it doesn't work nearly as well as, you, as you'd like to. Thing is, no one has the right answers. As I said, this is from the front lines. This is the stuff we're dealing with right now. No one knows how this is gonna go. I continue to have my hopes about uh, creativity and game design, and I, I'm sure you all do too. Um, one thing I'll say is that there's a very simple equation. I didn't make a slide for this. Innovation equals risk. We all want to be innovative in our work. Every time we innovate, we have to we take a risk. So what this is saying is, my, what my version is saying, is that as we um, take those risks, we have to measure them very carefully and understand where we are so we don't get out into, into places we don't want to be. OK. I hope that wasn't too much of a downer. <laughs> I want to move from that side of the chasm to the other side of the chasm, um, to AI, which I love. Um, there's a great promise of AI that it's going to make computers act like they do in the movies. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. And I don't know if you can name all of these. So we've been talking about AI in movies for a long, long time. And this has been a goal that people have, and I, I suspect, and we haven't talked to and, and worked with a lot of researchers, we all say, yeah, yeah, uh, just like how, or not just like how. In fact, uh, Dave Marks, I think, is, is the guy from the AI Programmers Guild uh, who made up what's called Rule Zero in AI, in AI research. Rules, anyone know what Rule Zero is? Don't make Skynet. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> I was at a, a, a GDC at a round table a few years ago, and, and someone said, oh yeah, but that's gonna invoke, invoke rule zero. And someone said, what's, what's rule zero? And half the people from around very emphatically said, don't make Skynet. So it's something people do keep in mind. One of the questions I have is, if we're making essentially a Tin Man, which one are we gonna meet? For a long time, for the majority of the history of AI, uh, it's been considered to be the domain of reason. And the emotion is this sort of superfluous thing off to the side. What we discovered now, or in, in the last few years from, from neuroscience, is that emotions aren't separate from cognition. They are an integral portion of cognition. And in fact, if you try and separate them out, what you do is you rob cognition and reason of all of its power. Um, I, again, I don't have time to go into to a lot of these things, but uh, if, you, if you're interested, look up a um, uh, patient's name, the code name was Elliot, a uh, fellow who had, who had a, an injury to his brain, um, who had perfect reason, had no access to his emotions anymore, and he could not make any decisions. He couldn't decide what shirt to wear, or what to have for lunch, or which pencil to pick up, because he was completely disconnected from his emotional abilities. It's a, it's a fascinating case. So my thought on this is that, um, there's one thing I want to say there, that, that there's also some really good research that shows that if you give people a, an appliance that appears to be intelligent, and in particular, if it appears to be in any way anthropomorphic. And our abilities to make things anthropomorphic are stunning. You do the three hole plugs. You can look at those and the, the, the little faces going, oh no. You know, we, there's actually a, the Latin word for that about making a face out of something. I don't know what that is now. Anyway, if you have a situation where something like that is intelligent and it doesn't have emotions, people see it as falling into uncanny valley, where it's this very strange zombie clown mind like thing that no one's having part of. So we know that emotions are, are important. So that's been the focus of what I've done uh, for the last 12 years in terms of trying to create uh, social and emotional AI. This is a screenshot from a, an old demo that I had. Um, two uh, agents, in, in software embodied agents with um, different motivations on the top um, and emotional display in the bottom. And what we were doing in this demo was we were giving them different things to look at and to react to. So like right now, they've just been shown that there's a corpse and this actually makes him a little more social and, and a little more desirous of using his skill, like he's seen corpses before, they don't particularly bother him. She's much more bothered by, and actually in this case angry, which is interesting, uh, about, about seeing a corpse. Um, her, uh, her desire to be safe and her desire to do something have both popped up. Um, this is the kind of thing that uh, I think uh, will lead us to AI that has personality, motivations, goals, memories, and really importantly, emotions. So social AI um, is, a, and this is my term I should say, embodies uh, uh, NPCs as social actors in the environment. They're more than vending machines. You're not going to say, you know, bring me 10 rat hives. They have their own um, internal memories and personality and goals. 
Um, and to me, the, the really interesting thing about this is it creates a kind of scaffolding um, and an environment for social relationships. Um, so that uh, um, what this leads us to eventually is that people with each other, humans with each other, and with AIs can actually uh, derive meaning from this. And we'll see how this works in just a couple of minutes. Um, and so in terms of why social AI, um, I already talked about uh, uh, creating a relationship with NPCs. And this, um, this I think, this is sort of my thesis, is that um, this will drive us, or it, it'll, it'll open up uh, the pathway to, to deeper stories, um, that we can have more effective narrative and more effective uh, open environments with AIs with whom we can interact socially. I think there's also some really interesting potential for uh, looking at cognitive science from the generative point of view, in terms of really trying to, to explain something that's already existing, make a model of it, and see, see if that explains things. And then I think also it, it leads to some really new uh, and interesting application that we can talk about later if you want. Okay, I mentioned before characters you, I mentioned before cultural references you might not get. This is one of them. Does anyone who, well, Colonel Henry Blake says it. Does anyone who this, know who this is? Okay, there's a couple of you enlightened souls. Okay, and Michael, yeah. Uh, this is a guy who was a, a character on a very popular show in the early 80s, MASH. Uh, he was killed very unexpectedly. It was a huge deal. My wife cried, and she, by the way, she hates it when I tell this story. Um, she cried and cried when they, they, they didn't even tell the actors, by the way. It's a really effective scene. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, the guy left the show, he, wanted, he just wanted off the show, so they wrote him out of the show, but they, but they didn't tell any of the actors they were going to kill him. And they had one of the characters come in and to this operating room where all, they were all operating and tell him he, he had just died. And it was this moment where your stomach just dropped out. And it was a huge cultural moment. We care about this guy even though he was a paper-thin, maybe by a lot of standards, TV character. So just the fact that we had some insight into who he was, what his personality was, his, his emotions, his humor, all of that, um, it, it really made him an, an effective character. Now, if you don't get that one, how about this one? Okay? Yeah. Everyone has an, has an opinion on Tyr uh, Tyrion Lannister. Uh, not everyone. A lot of people do. Okay. Or these. I love these charts, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, when we were reading these books at home, we, we, we talked a lot about, um, what's her name? Anyone remember? Professor Umbridge. Um, Umbridge, thank you. Yes, Umbridge. Uh, actually, I just wanted to see if anyone say it out loud. Um, and then these guys. Has everyone seen this? Okay. So, how did you feel when Sherlock took a swan dive off that building? Is he dead? Okay, they're, they're filming the next season. So I'm guessing he's probably not dead. But I, once in a while, I would love to see someone take a franchise like this and say, no, we're just going to kill it. <laughs> but the, the, uh, the fact is that we have a connection with these characters that we rarely, if ever, experience. Well, not, not never, but rarely experience in games. And a lot of it's because we, we relate to these people on an emotional level, not just on a narrative level. If you just had, uh, you got this guy, and he's kind of cranky, and he's very smart, and he does stuff around London, that's not going to do anything for anybody. Uh, you got another show where there's a lot of political intrigue, uh, okay, you know, again, not going to anything. You have to bring in the emotions of it to make it meaningful. So this is, um, emotions in particular is one of the big requirements of social AI. Emotions is what allows us to build a relationship between the players, the player characters, and the NPCs. Um, in addition, there's other things that, again, I'm going to have to sort of set aside for today. Um, in terms of the NPCs having their own beliefs and opinions and reputation. Reputation is a fantastically interesting subject because in my opinion, really no one's doing it quite right. Um, they have to be able to learn, they have to learn about you, and this is where reputation comes in. If I'm an NPC and Michael comes into my shop and cheats me, I'm gonna tell all of you, Michael's not a very good guy. And then if he comes in and does a great thing for me, then I'm gonna come in and say, hey, I'm gonna tell you all, when you meet this guy, he's all right. So in, in a game sense, if you walked into one shop and the guy said, no, 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 I've heard about you, your, your, your money's not welcome here. Imagine that, now you have a social landscape because an NPC has applied a reputational value to you. This is the kind of thing we're not seeing yet, and I think will, again, make for a much deeper world. And I'm not even going to talk about the Asian, arch the Asian architecture, because, man, that's a, that's a long way to talk. I will say this. There's a couple things I want to bring out. Agents having personality. One of the things we've done is taken the, uh, the big five and essentially treated them as a, as a normal curve, a very shallow normal curve, with each end being pathological. This makes for some really interesting characters. And if you're interested in fiction writing, by the way, this is an interesting little seed for making characters who aren't just kind of vanilla. 
Uh, by the way, one of the hardest ones you've had was uh, uh, understanding or, or agreeableness. What if someone's too agreeable? What does that mean? How does that become pathological? Well, they can become a doormat, or they can become oversensitive. So there's, there's always sort of pathological ends to these spectrums. And then I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the emotional space. This is uh, the, the bare bones of the model that we use. This is a, a standard, fairly standard. Um, a, um, wow, I got that backwards. I can't believe I did that. Uh, arousal on the y-axis. Strange, I'm not sure that happened. Uh, so not aroused, a very aroused, and valence, unhappy to happy. This comes from Russell originally, and a lot of people have used it. Um, I don't use, for those of you who know about the, um, uh, what's the third dimension? Uh, dominance. I don't use that because in, it, it comes out in different ways. In particular, what I've done is adapted uh, Maslow's hierarchy um, into different layers. They correspond about 90% to Maslow. Um, where each layer has generates emotions based on the satisfaction of motivations at that layer um, in the same arousal valence space. One of the interesting things that this sort of generates as a hypothesis is that different emotions at different layers that have the same coordinates feel about the same. There's a really interesting example. My favorite one is probably shame and guilt. In our culture, we confuse those all the time. And there's a lot of cultures that don't confuse them at all because they, they've got very set ways you deal with shame and very set ways to deal with guilt. Uh, shame in this sense is the threat or reality of social exclusion. You've just done something terrible and your family or friends or class will never talk to you again. Guilt is much more internal. Uh, so excuse me, shame occurs in the social layer. Guilt occurs in the values layer where you, you violated some internal value of your own even if no one else knows it. So no one else may be shaming you, but internally you feel this and they have the same coordinate in this uh, negative, valence, positive arousal space. Uh, that leads you to feel the same way and get confused about them, which leads to all kinds of, of interesting uh, effects. Just some quick examples. This is from the, uh, the lowest layer, the physiological layer, which I should say is also the uh, fastest layer in terms of onset and duration. It doesn't last very long. Um, you can feel disgust in an instant, and it can be gone in an instant. Uh, you can feel pleasure in an instant, it can be gone in an instant. Um, and these are also ones that are, that are most physiologically mediated as opposed to cognitively mediated, so they, they have the, you, you can't think yourself out of being hungry. Um, actually, you kind of can, but that's, again, a whole other subject that comes from the, the top-down uh, cognitive to, to physiological mediation. Uh, this is from the, um, uh, from the next layer, the layer of dealing with control objects, uh, Maz referred to it as safety. Um, Playing with your environment, uh, being more than just angry, but being enraged at something in the environment. Um, these sound like really fine definitions, but they're, again, they're part of that is because we feel them the same, and you have to really disentangle them very, very carefully. And then finally, the very highest layer, uh, what I've called contribution, what Maslow called self-actualization, uh, where you have emotions related to how you interact with a larger group or cause. Um, this is where real <coughs> joy comes from. Not pleasure, not feeling socially included, but real long-term joy. And this is the, also the layer that has the longest, most difficult onset, and then lasts the longest. This, this leads to some discussions about things like why we invest ourselves in things that aren't really going to make ourselves happy. I'm not happy because I don't have any friends. So instead of going out and getting friends, I'm going to have ice cream. Because ice cream gives me pleasure right now, which, has, which feeds that same coordinate in, in the, the arousal valence space. And some parts say, ooh, ooh, I know what we can do. We can have ice cream, and ice cream will work immediately, as opposed to figuring out how to go make friends. Or um, I'm stuck in a loveless relationship, but I really want to have joy in my life. How do I do that? Well, um, one of the things that people don't like to hear, and yet you may have heard from your parents or from others, and it's remarkably effective, if you're ever feeling down, I'm not talking about clinically depressed, but if, you're just, if, you're, if things aren't right, the best thing you can do is to go help somebody else. People talk about getting out of themselves, um, moving, moving beyond themselves, forgetting yourself. This is the thing that will, that is the hardest to do because all of the motivation is saying, no, 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 ice cream. Ice cream is the ticket. Let's have ice cream. But what you want to do is go help somebody. It's just, it's an amazing thing to see how effective it is. And this is the kind of thing that, that can really bring you joy in the long term. Okay, I'm over time a little bit because I would definitely make sure we have time for questions. But I definitely want to talk about story because I think it's, uh, story is something that we've had as far as we know, for at least 10 or 12,000 years, and I suspect for, you know, given cave paintings for 100,000 years or so. So this is something that's very, very human. It's what we do. 
my definition, and there are as many definitions, I think, as there are people talking about story. Uh, my defini definition is that it comes from unresolved conflicts in people and relationships. It can be a person with a relationship to themselves, to somebody else, to the environment. This is like the classical definition. To have conflict, you need to have something that you want. You need to have a goal. Um, if any of you have read um, McKee's book, Story, it talks about the inciting incident. And by the way, if you haven't read Story, I highly recommend it. Um, it um, often, I should say, often here requires social relationships in that you can have a completely internal dialogue and, and make a story out of it, but it's really difficult. We are social creatures, and a lot of our conflict comes from social relationships. Um, the hero's journey is a wonderful distillation of how an individual has conflict with themselves, with others, and with the environment. But it's only one story, and it's not, it's not the totality of them. And then the key for me is that we evaluate stories through emotions. We don't evaluate them through events. I go to the grocery store, I get my groceries, I come home, I found out I missed the oranges. Okay, it's a narrative, there's events, it's not much of a story. Add to that, and my dying wife, the only thing she wanted was one more orange. Suddenly there's emotion there. Yeah. Suddenly there's a real story there. How could you forget the oranges? It's like those scenes in the movies where the guy goes right past the oranges. Like, no, no, stop, get the oranges. We evaluate these things through emotion, not through reason. And this is why it's so important to have emotion in our, in our characters and the, the opportunity for emotion and relationships with our characters. So I kind of want to take, a, a take two on story um, and call it, define them again as, as a seri series of events with meaning. The with meaning is the, the important part there. Um, players and NPCs have to have goals. They have to have things they want. Um, and the best I'll say, and this is something that I, it's like a, a life goal for me, is to make NPCs that have goals that I haven't created, that aren't pre-tabulated. Um, you may have heard this, of this game Prom Week, maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure. um, really a, a fantastic work. Um, but every time I played that or a facade like that, it's like, no, 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 but I want there to be a goal that I haven't ever expected. I want someone to say, I don't want to go to the prom. I want to go to the car shop. Whoa, what? <laughs> why, why would you want to do that? But this is what happens in life. This is, in fact, the essence of the inciting incident in, in fiction. Uh, someone says, um, give me your phone number. And instead of giving you a phone number, they say no, and they slap you and they run away. <laughs> what should happen there? I have no idea, but there's a story there. So players and NPCs have goals, differing, conflicting goals. Different goals cause conflict. Resolving the goals requires actions. Actions have consequences. And this is the thing, if the world designers allow it, because for the last 20 years, we've been very, very careful not to let you have consequences in a game. It's a little like the Gilligan's Island Syndrome or the, the Simpson Syndrome. Lisa Simpson, when one episode says, don't worry, Bart, somehow every 22 minutes, everything returns to normal. <laughs> There's never any consequences. The consequences are what make meaning. So we have to allow our, our characters in our games to have actions that are not optimal, that are conflicting, and that's where we'll get the meaning from. It. So, can AI give us a story? I think so. Um, it's character driven as opposed to plot driven. It can be um, a directive. It, it can be you know, characters running around making their own stories. Or it could be a, an unseen character acting as the director or as the curator of the world. We're only going to show you the interesting parts of this world, not the, not the really boring parts. Like I said, it requires uh, goals and a dynamic world. Um, one of the things I'm most, or two things, the bottom two things, are really ones I'm most interested in, personal NPCs, um, sidekicks, family members, and a nemesis. Who would Sherlock be without Moriarty? I mean, okay, he'd be smart, that's great. But he's, he's got Moriarty, he's got Irene Adler. How much more interesting is he with those two personal NPCs, if you will? And, and Watson, let's not forget Watson. Uh, but Watson is sort of our stand in the world. And then the world story. This is something I've been harping on for a long time. Uh, world of Warcraft, um, I pick on World of Warcraft unfairly, really. It's a wonderful game. Played a lot. They could have created a world story. They could have said, this game is going to be about asking the question, what does it mean to be at war? Think about that. Think of all the stories that could come out of that. And then everyone playing it, all 12 million and 10 million now, 8 million people playing it, could come away with, oh, I now have a different understanding of what it means to be at war. But that would require a world that was dynamic and that had consequences. And that doesn't make for really commercial success in the current models we have. So instead they said, no, 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 there's the alliance of the horde, here's the battle lines, go. There's really no story there. But I think that having an overarching narrative with um, each person having their own personal narrative, just like we do in the real world, we all have our own stories we're living. 
is the way that I think AI can really enable story that, that uh, we don't have yet. Meaning to me, as I, as I said before, is really the, sort of the ultimate form of, of story, the goal of story, and the ultimate form of engagement. Um, if the agents aren't believable, they aren't going to have meaning. And if they don't, don't have meaning, that's when you get in all kinds of really interesting social pathologies with people doing things in, to each other and to NPCs in online games that they would never do otherwise. Um, I think, as I said before, it may also give us a, a window and validate some psychological models, but that's, uh, again, the, sort of the, the two sides of, of, of the chasm. So, to return to that, there is this chasm between games and AI. When I talk about AI, this kind of AI at work, I get a lot of quizzical looks. When I talk about some of the stuff we, we deal with, like, let's do a contract analysis on these you know, 25 features to see which player is going to like it, I get quizzical looks from, from folks like you. There is this big chasm. In my mind, the thing that can unite them, that's going to take a lot of time and a lot of work, is, is AI. Meaning, the mean that comes from deriving, me, deriving meaning from a world because you have investments there, you have relationships there, you have people you care about, and not just other players, but scriptable, curatable, directable NPCs, characters in that world. That, to me, is what is going to bridge this chasm. Um, now, I've said a lot about about AI and, and, and also a lot about um, uh, unpaved roads <laughs> and dangerous white water, things that are keeping this, this, uh, the chasm open and the chasm apart. I do want to leave you with one inspirational thought, and I, I realize this, okay, maybe a little shoehorn in there, but this is such a perfect thing. I love this quote. You've probably all seen it before. I didn't realize it until recently this is Alan Kay. Does anyone know, you guys know who Alan Kay is? Okay. Michael, who's Alan Kay? <laughs> uh, Famous researcher at Xerox Park uh, it, pop popularized the uh, Windows mouse interface. Um, sort of uh, wasn't quite the inventor, but um, uh, yeah, yeah, and put it also, together in a, in a very uh, smooth, elegant package. And the visionary behind the DynaBook, which is really sort of the grandfather of every laptop and tablet you have, uh, in nineteen in early nineteen seventies, which is I kind of what's that like? That's like one of you guys coming up with a really accurate version of. Household fusion. I don't know something like that. <laughs> um, but he's—I he's, he, guess he's, he's sort of a, a hero of mine. The, the thing is that, that we don't know what the future holds. None of us do, um, and we don't know what really we can do with games or AI. These are things I've talked about today. Are things I think we can do. Um, we really don't know what story is going to be about in ten years. Um, but the best way is, as he said, to predict the future is to invent it. And I look forward to experiencing what you guys all invent. Thanks very much.